morning. Good morning. Welcome to Brookmead Congregational Church for our worship this morning. I'm Pastor Liz DeWeese. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm just so glad that we can gather together in this space as we come together for worship this morning. Uh, we welcome you who are joining us online as well and hope that we can create an experience for you to feel like you belong. For all of us as we come to this space, I want to um, remind you that no matter who you are or where you are on this journey, you are welcome here. And we are working to create a space where you feel like you belong. So if there are ways we can do that better, we always welcome the feedback. As we set our minds and our hearts for this experience of worship, I want to take a moment to set our intention for the experience. That's right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set our intention by inviting the things that want to draw our attention away to just wait. I like to envision those things. Sometimes I like to invite them to wait outside that window because then I can just tell them, no, nope, you can just wait because they like to creep back in, right? And I can see them and I can say, you can wait out there. But sometimes what I've done is I've envisioned a box that I can put them in or the trunk of the car where I can invite them to just wait because every time they creep back in, and I get distracted and I'm not present anymore, when I notice, I can say to them, not right now, I need to be here. And every time that I've done that, what I've learned is that they're still in the trunk where I left them or outside the window and I am ready again to greet them. So in this moment, I invite us to take a breath and let it go and settle into the experience of being present for worship. As you are able and as you choose, I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Why are you here? I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, with a fire burning in my bones. I see it. You're in the right place. This is God's house. The door is open to you. Why are you here? I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, with a fire burning in my bones. We see that in you. You're in the right place. This is God's house. The door is open to you. Let us worship God. Let us learn from the Spirit. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, number 252.
and join in our opening prayer. Teaching God, we want to learn your ways. We want to learn the ways of forgiveness. We want to learn the ways of grace. We want to learn your ways of love. That is part of why we return to your text week after week. Because we are hungry to be more like you. So as we prepare to listen to your good word, calm the noise in our minds. Center our spirits to focus on you so that we might learn and hear what we have missed in this story before. God, we want to learn your ways. Meet us here. Speak your truth. Help us listen. Amen. Our first scripture reading of the day is from Psalm 119. How can young people keep themselves on the straight and narrow? By keeping to your words. With all my heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commands. In my heart I treasure your promise so that I keep from sinning against you. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare every ordinance you've spoken. I rejoice in the path of your decree as much as I would rejoice in great wealth. I meditate on your precepts and ponder your ways. I delight in your statutes. I will not forget your words. That uh, collection called Zero Church is one that uh, my mom introduced me to several years ago. And when I heard our psalm this morning, I thought, oh, we need to hear that piece and response to the psalm. So as we consider how we will respond to and learn from all of God's statutes, I invite you to consider how we can share peace with one another. That as Jesus left his disciples and offered to them peace, that that would be passed on to us, that we would share peace with one another. And so this morning, as we gather together as beloved community, I invite you to share peace with those around you, reminding you that we all know this is still germ season. Um, so uh, if someone greets you with, um, with a non-touching greeting, that is a blessing. If someone offers a hug and you want to give one back, you are welcome to. Um, but I will leave that up to you. Just know that it's, it's still a blessing if someone chooses not to touch you. It's okay. This is just peace that we're passing with one another and not jerks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I invite you to stand and share peace. Well, as we come to this time when we share what's happening in the life of the church, I would like to invite forward this morning Reverend Kim Wood, who is our conference minister and is joining with us and would like to bring greetings from the conference today. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be here in Nashville with you all this morning on this gorgeous day so far. We don't know what it looks like every hour around here. <laughs> I bring you greetings from the conference, from the conference staff, uh, from Reverend Heather Fosberg and Don Harris, our communications director, and Minister Carol Moss, who's been out on medical leave. So we invite you to keep her in your thoughts and your prayers. Uh, also from the board of directors of the conference and from your sibling uh, congregations all across the Southeast Conference, way over on the East Coast and, and down to the South Gulf and everywhere in between. It is good to be here today. I wanna to share a couple of things with you. Um, I am delighted to tell you that 
this year's annual meeting is coming up faster than we think, but not as fast as it usually does because we've moved it to August, third weekend in August, the 16th and 17th. You know, it's not all that far from you. It's in Fairfield Glade, just a bit, a bit to the east of you all. So I hope you will come out. We will also have virtual offerings and um, all kinds of possibilities for for pre-events and education and fellowship and just being together being together whatever that means online or whether we are standing on site it is wonderful to worship with you today and i thank you for your hospitality and the blessings of spending this lenten sunday with you thank you thank you reverend kim we appreciate that um every week we try to let you know what's happening in the life of our church you have an insert uh that as we're uh, continuing with the wandering heart um program through sanctified art we've got artwork each week and there's a um a description by the artist of the artwork for this week so if you want to take a minute and look at that um at some point uh, also, we include our schedule of what's going on on a different colored piece of paper, and we, uh, there are descriptions of all the things that are happening in the life of the church. Um, we have a spring cleaning coming up this weekend uh, to get us ready for the Easter holiday, and then there are all of the wonderful Easter events that are happening during the week out of Holy Week, um, Monday, Thursday, and then uh, Easter sunrise, and potluck and worship service and an Easter egg hunt for little ones. So all the things that are happening as we get closer and closer to Easter. Um, we also have uh, one more yoga class that will be happening before we figure out what they've decided, what the yoga class decides to do um, as their teacher is going on maternity leave. Um, and then uh, also there are uh, some other events that are coming up uh, in early April. We've got a Project Cure Day. We've got um, a memorial service for Naomi Faust, the open mic night uh, and coffee house, and then our new garden dedication service that will be on Sunday, April 28th. I do want to also make note that this morning uh, we will remember uh, Steve again in our prayer time, our, our regular accompanist. He had shoulder surgery, shoulder replacement surgery on Monday. Is doing really, really well, so he's not having much pain, but was feeling a little nauseous, so decided he would wait a week before he came back, so invited his friend Steve Digby to be with us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Steve brought his mother with him too, so we, we welcome you as well this morning. If there are no other things happening in the life of the church, yay! <laughs> I invite our children to come forward for a moment with them. Welcome, you guys. I'm glad to see you this morning. How are you doing? Good? I like it. That's great. So today, we're going to talk about how Jesus is a teacher. Do you guys ever go to classes where you have teachers? Yeah. So what do the teachers do? Do we need to ask for the adults to help us a little? What do the teachers do? Do they stand up front? Or do they sit down on the floor with you sometimes? <coughs> they sit down in your class? Yeah, I like that. You know, Jesus, when he was a teacher, he always sat down before he started teaching. That was part of, that was part of his um, culture. The, the teacher sits down before they start to teach. Just funny because in our culture, the teacher stands up when they start to teach sometimes. It depends on what they're teaching, though. Well, sometimes, too, teachers will sit down and read a story. Yeah? Yeah? And we can learn from the story some things. Well, teachers are people who teach us things. So that means our brains are growing, right? Yeah, our brains are always learning new things. Like, 
just a month ago, this guy didn't, couldn't stand on his feet and walk yet. But watch this. His brain is growing, and he's about to show us, maybe, except that he's not going to perform for us because that's not his job, right? Um, so, so, but all of us have growing brains, and our teachers help us to, to shape that brain so that, it can, so that we can learn all the good things that we need to know. And sometimes we learn hard lessons that make us sad or scared, and sometimes we learn really happy lessons that make us just want to cry. Right? Yay! Yeah. So Jesus is a teacher. That's right. Jesus is a teacher, and Jesus is teaching his disciples. Today, he's teaching his disciples how to have arguments. Isn't that weird? Yeah, right? That's so weird. But you know what? He's teaching them how to do it in a way that helps everybody to feel like they are heard and like they belong. And so it helps them to learn how to do it in a fair way, right? And that's what Jesus is teaching today. So I want, I want you all to know that Jesus is a teacher and that Jesus will keep teaching us even as we grow. Will you guys pray with me? Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all of our teachers who help to shape our brain. We thank you for these magnificent brains that, that grow and learn and help us to become who we need to be. We pray all of this thanksgiving in your name. Amen. Amen. See you guys. Friends, when you study Peter's story... <laughs> when you study Peter's story in scripture, which we haven't yet heard this morning, but we will soon, it's almost impossible to ignore how much he loved to ask questions. He asks Jesus, what does the parable mean? Where are you going? How many times must we forgive? Like a tenacious toddler, Peter was full of questions because Peter was eager to learn. Sometimes I wish I was more like that. I still have so much to learn. So friends, let's be like Peter. Let's return to Christ with the humility of a student as we pray together the prayer of confession. Let this be a moment of learning. Let us pray. Holy God, we long to be lifelong learners. We long to approach you with curiosity and an open mind. Instead, we often live as if we know best. We forget that the disciples called you Rabbi, teacher. Forgive us for the times when we fail to be curious. Forgive us for the times when we assume we know the best. Forgive us for the moments when we imagine that our learning is done and that we have all the answers. Like Peter, who was brave enough to ask, how many times should we forgive? Make us brave. Spark a desire in us to learn. And may our curiosity carry our faith into deeper waters. With hope and humility, we pray. Amen. Family of faith, when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus responded with abundance. That abundance exists for you as well. No matter what you have done or left undone, no matter what lessons you have learned or are still learning. God's abundant grace exists to you, for you. God's love will never run out. So hear and rest in this good news. You are forgiven. You are loved. 
you are invited to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our final scripture reading is from the 18th chapter of Matthew. If your sibling should commit some wrong against you, go and point out the error, but keep it between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won a loved one back. If not, try again, but take one or two others with you so that every case may stand on the word of two or three witnesses. If your sibling refuses to listen to them, refer the matter to the church. If they ignore even the church, then treat that loved one as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. The truth is, whatever you declare bound on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you declare loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth join in agreement to pray for anything whatsoever, it will be granted you by my Abba, God in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. <coughs> Peter came up and asked Jesus, when a sibling wrongs me, how many times must I forgive? Seven times? No, Jesus replied, not seven times. I tell you, 70 times seven. God is still speaking. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now a poetry reading entitled Teach Me, the same title as our message today from Pastor Liz. Teach me about the ways of the wind, about the ways of the world, about the ways of the heart. Teach me about the soft crook of my lover's arm and the way two souls can hold each other close. Teach me about forgiveness, about the language of I'm sorry, and the softness of sincerity. Teach me about abundance, about 70 times seven, and all the days of my life. Teach me about joy, about its contagious weaving and its soul healing. Teach me about mercy, about open hands and deep breaths. Teach me about the dawn of time and the stars in the sky. Teach me what matters most. Teach me what is mine to do Teach this achingly curious heart until I run out of questions or I run out of days. Teach me some malevolent sonnet and I will have a life well lived. Let us pray. Teach me. Teach us. Teach us how to pray, how to live, how to follow, how to love. Teach us how to argue, how to participate in conflict, in disagreement, in peaceful discourse. Teach us fairness. Teach us how to forgive again and again. And again, teach us how to let go of pain and how to let go of perceived safety. Teach us, teach me. 
and may this word be a blessing to all who receive it. Amen. Not all of my work is, has been done in churches. Some of it has been done uh, volunteering with nonprofit organizations. And one of those organizations, in one of those organizations, I had a leadership role on the board. I want to tell you a story about Kate. Kate was a woman in her 50s when I was in my early 30s. She had a job that allowed her to travel all over the world. She was often in China, or she was in somewhere in Europe, or she was all over the world. And she would train people how to learn from surveys and focus groups. So she had done surveys and focus groups and worked herself up to being the trainer of the trainers who would train people about how to do focus groups. She worked for a big company, one that you would know the name of, and she and her family were financially very comfortable. They were also major donors to the nonprofit I was working with. It would happen on occasion that Kate would be out of town during a board meeting and would come home to find out that not only did things not happen the way she expected them to happen, but there were friends of hers on the board who weren't exactly happy with the outcome of whatever progress we were trying to make together, even though we had done the work to build consensus, to try to move forward. And so she would hear through the grapevine and Kate liked me. She wanted me to succeed in this leadership position and thought it was her job to mentor me through this work, especially with folks who had money to donate and wanted the organization to succeed, but didn't know me that well. At first, I was very grateful for Kate's leadership and mentorship. I appreciated that she wanted to teach me things I wanted to learn. But after a while, I began to notice a pattern in the way that she would approach me about how to adjust what was happening complaints about my leadership, so to speak. You see, Kate liked to come home from a work trip and take me out to lunch, just the two of us, so she could help me. Usually this meant she wanted to correct my behavior without the context of hearing the work I was doing or what side, you know, anything that I might have to say about it. She had already made her decision about what I needed to learn from the, from the experience, so she came to take me out to lunch, a nice place where we could sit down quietly and have this conversation, and she could teach me what I needed to learn from the situation. She would have heard what had happened from friends on the board and assumed that she had the whole story, and she would take me to lunch. She would help me understand from her perspective how to do better. And like I said, in the beginning, I really appreciated this. It helped me to try and get to know people a little bit, to understand how I could fit a little better into this system. The problem was when I would bring up our conversations at board meetings and share some of the things that Kate had told me at lunch, she would deny it and change her story. After about three experiences like this over several years, they weren't back to back, you know, they kind of happened over time. So it took a while to piece together this pattern of behavior. But after piecing together the pattern, I finally decided to reach out to my coach in ministry and ask for some suggestions about how to deal with this behavior that continued to, from my perspective, set me up for failure with the board of this nonprofit organization I was working with. You see, Kate had returned from another business trip and had reached out to me and wanted to go to lunch. And by now, I knew what to expect from lunch, just the two of us. She had a few things she wanted to discuss. Being a good coach, 
He asked me, well, Liz, what do you want to do? <sighs> this is what coaches do if you know anything about coaching. Instead of giving you the answer, they say, the answers are all inside of you. What do you want to do? I love that. That's great. It helps me to learn more about myself and how I need to approach it, not how my coach would approach it, right? So, Liz, what do you want to do? And I thought about it. And this text that we heard this morning came to my mind about how do we approach people when we have a conflict? How do we talk about things that come between us? I told my coach, I think I would like to tell her, I would be happy to meet with her, but that I would like for her to send me, email me a list of her concerns before we meet so that I can be better prepared for how to talk to her about what it is she's concerned about. I would also like to bring one other member of the board with us to lunch. I'll pay for their lunch so that we can both be heard and make sure that we're saying to one another, that what we're saying to one another is understood. That what I'm saying is communicating what I think it's communicating. And not just, you know, sometimes I get tangled up in my words. Maybe this is a me thing. Also, maybe she's not hearing her own words and maybe she could use some help of reflection back and forth. And I thought, you know, a, a neutral person from the board that we could invite. But if it made her feel better and she wanted one of her friends to come, that would be okay too. We could make that work. My coach said, I think those are reasonable and thoughtful expectations. Cool, excellent, that's what I'm gonna do. But, he said, you should be prepared for her to tell you she doesn't wanna have lunch with you after all. And I thought, oh, I was actually really grateful for that advice because I wouldn't have been prepared for that. I would have been prepared that, oh, she would my expectations. But, and I think it might have hurt my feelings if I hadn't been prepared because I would have taken it personally, like it was about me. Like I had done something wrong by asking for some boundaries around this conversation. But when I expected that response, it turned out I was just affirmed in my understanding that this behavior was, in fact, manipulative. She meant to try and manipulate me in that situation and only worked when she and I were one-on-one. -on -one. It didn't work when somebody else was present. When Kate declined to have lunch with me after my request to bring someone along and to have a list of concerns so I could prepare, I realized that now I was free from needing to take on the stress of Kate's expectations that could never be met. They weren't mine anymore. I didn't have to live up to her expectations because they were never mine to begin with. And the work with the nonprofit board became less stressful after that for a while until Kate's friends decided to make my work harder. <laughs> And that's when I knew that the system needed to change if, it were, if we were going to be successful. But I hadn't been asked in my role to help that system change. So I stepped down and allowed the nonprofit to find someone else to deal with the behavior because it wasn't mine anymore. But thank you for the opportunity and for the leadership experience and for all of the good things that came from that, including learning how to set boundaries with people who wanted to manipulate me. This was all good stuff, good learning that I got for ministry and for other things. I wonder what would have happened if Kate, instead of declining the lunch I proposed, had agreed to it. I wonder if she had been open to hearing some of what I had to say maybe even open to hearing her own words repeated back to her, echoed back to her. If she might have understood what she was asking of me was quite impossible. And that there were ways we could work together to make something new. I wonder how that would have changed the work of the whole system. 
I wonder if it would have been easy for me to just forgive her behavior if there were a change. When Jesus teaches the disciples about how to deal with a conflict between two people in the beloved community, he teaches them that direct communication is the first step, always. Speak directly to the person that you have a problem with. Make sure that you go to them directly. Direct communication is always the first way to address conflict. Otherwise, the consequences of gossip get messy, right? When you go talk to somebody else first and then ask them to go talk to somebody for you, telephone is always a messy game. It just is. It's never quite exactly right. But direct communication one-on-one can also be unpredictable. We bring into any conversation a myriad of layers that can interfere with direct communication, including how much have you had to eat today? How much rest did you get last night? That comes with you into the conversation, right? Who does the person that I'm talking to remind me of? That comes into the conversation. What does this subject matter make me think about? That comes into the conversation, even if I don't mean for it to. I have to do really intentional work to set those things aside in order to be engaged in the conversation, and on and on and on. We might think we're being clear in our communication, but we may not be communicating well to the person with whom we are communicating. Maybe they don't understand the concepts the same way that I do as I'm describing them. Maybe the words that I'm using aren't saying the things I think that they're saying. Direct communication can get messy. So Jesus suggested if direct communication is not working well, bring one or two people from the beloved community with you. If I find it helpful when I do this to make sure that they're neutral people in the conversation, trusted people by the community to be good listeners, right? People who are listening to what's happening. Not to mention good communicators. That helps as well. If they can use their words well, that's a good person to choose. Pay attention to detail that might be missed by other parties who aren't listening or paying attention. But Jesus knew that even with a few witnesses to the conversation, people can get can feel ganged up on in that kind of a situation. And what does ganged up on get us? Defensive, right? Are we listening well when we're defensive? Probably not. We're probably listening to respond instead of listening to learn, right? And refusing to listen or hear beyond our own perspective in that situation. If step two fails, then, and only then, only after you've done these first two things, that's when you go to the matter of, take the matter to the leadership of the beloved community so that both parties may be heard. And if the offender still cannot see their error, set a solid boundary with them. That's what Jesus says, set a solid boundary with them. But Peter asks the most poignant and timely question immediately after Jesus said, set a boundary. But Rabbi, what about forgiveness? If someone repents, how many times should we forgive them? As many as seven? Right, because seven is huge. If you know anything about numerology, seven is a holy number, right? A sacred number. Should we forgive them seven times? And Jesus replies, no, not seven. Seventy times seven. Can you imagine the eye popping that's happening at that moment? Seventy times? seven what are you talking about as they're trying to do the math in their head and comprehend what jesus is saying what does he mean 70 times seven is he talking about 49 times or does he mean 77 times what does that mean 70 times seven jesus wants us to prepare to be prepared to forgive as many times as it takes 
The number of times is not the point. It doesn't matter what 70 times seven means. It's a lot. It's a whole, whole lot. Just be prepared that forgiveness as many times as it takes is what we're called to. Consider for a moment how many times we would like for Abba God to forgive us. Every single time, right? Every time. It took some time, but I have let go of most of the anger I once had for Kate's behavior. You can still hear it a little bit in there. <laughs> she never asked for forgiveness and always maintained that she was only trying to help me. And I believe her in her mind, in her heart, she believed she was trying to help me. However, I have learned that setting healthy boundaries and communication and conflict is biblical. <laughs> it, we're taught how to do it by Jesus. So is forgiveness. Not just for kindness sake, although it is good to be kind and forgive people. That's, that's not the forgiveness we're talking about, though. That's not true forgiveness, and it's not just for your own sanity, because I've been told that too, right? I mean, we've all, we all kind of understand that sometimes forgiveness is about just letting go of the situation. But forgiveness that leads to healing is necessary for the beloved community. How do we get past those things that we can't see eye to eye on if we can't figure out how to forgive each other for when we are hurt? By one another. Let us lean on this blessing and good news. May Jesus continue to teach his followers how to work through conflict. May Abba God continue to bless us and teach us forgiveness, true forgiveness that leads to healing, and may the Holy Spirit teach us through her wisdom when and how to do both. And may we be ready and willing learners. Amen. Amen. As we reflect on the word this morning, I invite you to join me as we sing together our uh, him, come, O found of every blessing, number 459.
continue to lift all of the war, war torn areas of our world, um, uh, especially lifting up the people of Gaza, but also the people of Ukraine, um, also the people of the Congo. Uh, and I believe there are plenty more that I don't have in the top of my mind, but, uh, but we hold them all in our prayers. Um, also, I uh, lift as a joy the opportunity to continue to advocate with um, others in our state uh, for justice. I'll have a new opportunity on Tuesday. Um, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. I just remember reading an email and thinking, oh good, I get to go down to the state, state capitol again on Tuesday. <laughs> so there are so many reasons to be down there. So uh, I, I lift that as a joy though. It is a joy to be um, a body and a voice that can go and stand and speak and be present. So, um, so I, I thank you all for being with me in spirit and, and uh, for that opportunity. There are no other joys or concerns this morning. I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to bring our joys and our concerns to you. We lift up our concerns knowing that you do not put weight on them as though one is more important or more severe than the other, but that you see them all as important. And we are grateful, O oh God, that you know what weighs down our hearts, you know where our hearts are broken, and because of that, you are present with us in all of the places where our hearts are heavy, in all of the places where we worry and we carry too much, in all of the places where we struggle and work hard to make change, sometimes just to survive. We thank you, God, for being present in all of that. And we pray for those who are struggling now, those who are struggling in the face of war, and injustice, those who are struggling in the work of addiction and uh, a mental health challenge, those who are struggling in the midst of health issues, waiting on results, wondering about what's next, <coughs> healing still from surgeries and procedures. God, we pray for those who are mourning and who are grieving, and who are understanding a new way of living in the world because of that grief. We ask, O oh God, that as we lift up all of these challenges, that you would help us to see that that is only a part of the story. And we thank you, God, for the ways in which joy bring us delight and give us a chance to have a glimpse of your presence in its fullest awe around us through every moment of joy that we can lift and celebrate and give thanks for. And so this morning we lift all of this to you in the name of your son who taught us to pray together saying, Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in the invitation to generosity. We believe that questions are a building block of faith. How many times should I forgive? Jesus, where are you going? What must I do to inherit eternal life? We believe that humble curiosity can open our eyes. Where does it hurt? What do you need? How can I help? We believe that God is a teacher. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Here I am, send me. We believe that faith 
invites our whole being to engage with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. We believe in God's abundance. May God help our unbelief. It is I, be not afraid. You are called, you are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. Go now in peace, go trusting that good news. Amen. Amen.